The Connecticut River is New England's longest river, flowing 400 miles from the Canadian border to Long Island Sound. Its waters support a wide variety of fish and wildlife and have long been a resource for agriculture, recreation, and industry. The Vernon Hydroelectric Station in Vernon, Vermont, and Hinsdale, New Hampshire, is the southernmost of the six developments that make up Trans-Canada Hydro Northeast Connecticut River Hydroelectric System. Completed in 1909, the station was built to provide electrical power to burgeoning industries in central Massachusetts communities, including Clinton, Fitchburg, and Worcester. It was the first hydroelectric station east of Niagara Falls constructed to supply high-voltage electricity from a remote location over a long distance. As hydropower technology improved during the 20th century, the station was periodically upgraded. In 2006, a major project was undertaken to upgrade the station's capacity by replacing four of the original generating units with high-efficiency, state-of-the-art units. This program was produced to honor historic Vernon Station as it celebrates its first centennial of operation and the work done to ensure that it will continue to be an important source of clean renewable energy throughout the 21st century. The idea to harness the river was conceived by Henry Harriman and Malcolm Chase, two entrepreneurs who saw the growing demand for electricity in the neighboring state of Massachusetts. Their vision included economical power for New England, delivered through an interconnected power system. Site preparation began in May 1907. The project was a massive undertaking involving almost 500 workers and construction of railroad spurs, equipment warehouses, offices, and worker housing. Every step utilized the latest engineering and technological innovations and required perseverance in the face of natural obstacles and unpredictable New England weather. Excavation for the construction of the dam's abutments was achieved with high-pressure water jets a new and innovative technique that reduced site preparation costs. Construction of the dam began in July with a coffer dam to divert the river, creating a dry area for workers to lay the foundation and build the powerhouse and dam. Disaster struck in October of 1907 when the worst flood in 40 years swept away structures, tools and equipment. But the stoutly constructed coffer dam withstood the floodwaters and the work area remained intact. The men worked night and day to get the project back on schedule. Within a week, they had repaired the damage, just in time for the next challenge, the onset of winter. In December 1907, workers made the first pour of concrete for the modern Concrete Gravity Dam, a technologically advanced design that represented a departure from the rock-filled wooden crib structures that were typical of earlier New England dams. The grueling, round-the-clock schedule continued as steam locomotives delivered two cubic yards of concrete on an average of every two and a half minutes. Slowly but steadily, the dam took shape, raising the river level by 30 feet. When completed, the dam stood 58 feet high and 956 feet long. Construction of the powerhouse began in September 1908. The building was framed with steel girders and concrete and faced in brick. The design specified an open interior without structural columns to allow for a large traveling crane to move heavy machinery. The building was designed in the then popular Renaissance Revival architecture and featured floor-to-ceiling arched windows illuminating the hall containing the massive generators. The entrance door had to be large enough to allow the turbine and generator components to be brought inside. Plans specified the use of an innovative triple runner turbine design over the more common horizontal shaft configuration. A single 40-foot vertical shaft with three water wheels connected the turbines and generator. This design became obsolete almost before it went into service. In 1911, single runner vertical turbines installed on the Mississippi River were shown to be more efficient. Nevertheless, four of these original units have operated at Vernon for over 90 years. Five of the eight planned generators were installed in 1909, along with two hydroelectric excitation generators that were used to get them started. 
The remaining three generators were added the following year. Two 66,000 volt high tension transmission lines were constructed across New Hampshire and Massachusetts to supply power to customers as far as 66 miles away. The plan was to sell it to industrial customers and distribution companies. By 1910, electrical generation far exceeded the output of any other hydroelectric plant east of Niagara Falls. For Chase and Harriman, and the hundreds of workers, Vernon Station was a remarkable achievement. But transmitting power over many miles and selling it to industrial customers and distribution companies was an equal challenge. It was regarded by the elite of the electric industry as pure folly. In 1919, the original powerhouse was extended across the Vermont state line to accommodate two additional larger generating units. The expanded structure maintained the original design and housed 10 units by 1921. Chase and Harriman's gamble paid off. They proved that electricity produced from the waters of the Connecticut River was an efficient and reliable alternative to expensive coal-produced steam power. Formerly skeptical manufacturers lined up to sign power contracts. The first significant hydroelectric power plant on the river ultimately became the genesis of the New England Power Company's integrated system of hydroelectric plants. It included five additional stations on the Connecticut River and as many as eight on the adjacent Deerfield River. A century later, Vernon Station continues to provide low-cost clean power to the New England region. But what of the next 100 years? The future calls for growing use of domestic non-fossil energy sources. Will historic Vernon Station play an even more important role in meeting energy demands in its second century? Vernon Station has been remarkably reliable over the years. Although electrical upgrades to automate the plant took place between 1992 and 2008, the mechanical and generating elements remained the same since the 1920s. Finally, after a century in operation, the equipment began to show its age. The original triple runner units, known as Units 5 through 8, became costly to repair and maintain safely. It was time to modernize. The challenge was to perform the necessary equipment upgrades without significantly affecting the operation of the six remaining units or making changes to the exterior of the historic powerhouse. The project began with the dismantling of units five through eight. Piece by piece, the generators were taken apart with the help of the original crane installed 100 years ago. This would be one of its final tasks before replacement.
All the materials removed were recycled, including large amounts of copper from the original installation. Initially, dismantling the equipment was fairly routine. But the work became more difficult deeper down. The equipment had become corroded, and in some cases was mired in silt, which had to be removed by pail and shovel. The 40-foot three-wheel assemblies had to be cut into manageable pieces before extraction.
Once the equipment was removed, significant time was needed to remove additional silt from the base of the wheel pits and the draft tubes. From a structural standpoint, alteration to the powerhouse was one of the most critical aspects of the renovation. Rebuilding the interior of a powerhouse without altering the original footprint is an enormous feat of engineering. It required painstaking efforts by a dedicated project team to accomplish in an efficient, safe, and environmentally sensitive manner. Even the impact of construction noise on nearby nesting bald eagles was taken into account when selecting the excavation equipment. Removing concrete and bedrock was a complex balancing act. In order to accommodate the new units while maintaining the structural integrity of the powerhouse, concrete was repeatedly removed and added in a critical sequence. An access shaft was constructed leading to the base of the powerhouse to facilitate installation and future maintenance of the new units. This was a major improvement to the previous design. The intake elbows were the largest parts to be installed in the powerhouse. This required temporary removal of the original powerhouse door a key historic feature of the building. Even the frame was removed in order to squeeze the elbows through. Forms were lowered into the base of the excavated wheel pit to enable the concrete to be poured for the new draft tubes. New generator units have been designed with axial flow Kaplan runners. Water enters the flow tubes horizontally and is directed down through the elbows. The guide vanes control the flow to the Kaplan runner, which resembles a propeller. The angles of the guide vanes and runner blades can be adjusted to capture the maximum energy potential of the water. This allows for more efficient production of electricity, depending upon the river's flow. Vernon's power generation will increase on average by 40% with the installation of these new efficient units. This represents over 56,000 megawatt hours, enough to meet the electrical needs of 8,000 homes. Today, renewable power sources, including wind, solar, and hydro, are considered vital to meeting the nation's call for domestic clean energy to decrease our dependence on fossil fuel imports. Vernon Station has always been ahead of the curve. It was at the forefront of hydropower technology when constructed in 1908. Today, 100 years later, the station is ready to resume its role as an efficient and environmentally friendly provider of renewable energy. <laughs>